I'd, love, I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Geet Demel. Uh, Geet is uh, works for IBM, and he works uh, in the research uh, area. And he's going to talk to us about some of the insights that uh, IBM are developing in the field of artificial intelligence. I assure you that that was uh, something I've done wrong. <laughs> so, uh, it's great to follow uh, Chris's presentation because what I'm going to talk to you is much more to do with some of the research issues that we need to address, especially developing some of the capabilities that Chris spoke about. For example, the question that was asked at the back about different people and different accents. Same question being asked in different ways. How can you help machines to understand these kind of problems? Is exactly what we are talking about. So to start with, let's skip that. So just to give a quick background uh, to myself, uh, all he's trying to say is that um, I've been working on AI for a long time before AI actually became cool. Uh, and done a publication in this sector, just trying to say that I'm geeky and cool, but neither is true. But uh, this is something that uh, <coughs> will be useful to say some context. I'm originally from Sri Lanka, so 1995, when I was in Aberdeen, for example, if I tried using automated answering machines to do my work, well, those systems could not understand my accent. Whereas Alexa actually is pretty good uh, in about a week's time to figure out my accent and works perfectly right now. Uh, before I get into the focus of the talk today, I thought I'd give a quick introduction to IBM Research in the UK because we only really been here for about five years. Uh, after I've told the first time we met that he didn't realize that we just 30 miles down from border. We actually have two facilities. None of these pictures are actually, it, it looks perfect here, I'll actually do that. Uh, we have two facilities. One is in uh, Diaspora in Warrington. Uh, that's where we actually do look at a lot to do with core AI techniques, uh, especially at large scale. We have access to something like 100,000 core machines, and we try to do a lot of number crunching, trying to figure out next generation of voice recognition of formula uh, for shampoos, you name we do all of that. There. And then up in person, that's our mothership. Uh, we do a lot to do with AI at the edge, uh, especially things like uh, voice recognition, and uh, knowledge technologies. So I just thought I'll give you a quick recap on uh, digital excellence because it means different things to different people. Uh, these are not just my interpretations. Uh, this I put a bunch of uh, reference sources. You can have a look at it. But the key is very much if you achieve digital excellence, you need to really think about the right type of Wasn't me. <laughs> uh, and, and the speed and the quality of the uh, platform that you are providing. This is just a quick screen grab from some of the analysis from the Black Friday uh, output. So you can see like desktop smartphones and tablets. A lot of the traffic for the purchases actually went on mobile, but not all of them followed through. But whereas on desktops, it's only like really 37% of the people really look at items. But in terms of purchasing, majority of the purchasing came using a desktop. So what it means is that when you are deciding where to invest your money for the digital excellence, and this is key for organizations like ours, you need to think about just not only one platform and just can't rely on uh, one system. You need to think about broadly how these different platforms can help you. The, second, uh, the third one is actually trying to think about the continuous improvement. I think Chris is going to mention that because the system they are developing, they just got to keep improving that because otherwise someone else will be there in the first place and they'll have the market share. Uh, speed and quality is an interesting uh, point because latest research shows that if your web page or if your answer takes more than three seconds, people just move away from your question 
90% of the time. They only give you three seconds of attention. So if you can't give their needed answer in three seconds, you basically lost your customer. So in, in this case, like if you look at an education facility, it's your students. If you look at an online marketplace like Amazon or where you can see UK, those are your fee paying customers. They just move away from you. Not only that, you also need to think about the quality of the answer. Um, the times where you sort of give them a whole bunch of options and say that these are your answers, go figure your solution, is fast gone. People really, really want a precise answer now. Um, for example, as you saw in the previous demo, uh, you need a, a specialist answer for that. The last one is, uh, I think there was a question about security. Uh, people do care about end-to-end -end security, but this is not only in terms of you passing your information to someone, but you also want to make sure that information systems at the back end also secure information. So with all of these things, our premise is that things as it is over here do incremental steps. So most of these things provide you some form of automation. But a combination of these things will potentially provide you some autonomy. <coughs> so like in the case of Alexa or in any other uh, financial institution, education sector, when you ask a question, if the system can understand what you ask, if, you, if the system can understand your emotional coefficient in that particular situation and provide you the answer, that really is where we want to be. And in a sense, this is what exactly we do at IBM Research. I did this screen grab this morning. We focus on four different areas. Uh, this is public information, you can always find that. Uh, trust me, this list keeps getting updated. Uh, every time we have a different strategy, this gets updated. But the core aspects remain the same. We are an organization that looks at core AI techniques, how to make today's systems better for tomorrow. But our tomorrow is really the 10-year horizon. We want to really look at what could be the next best thing in the 10 years' time. We do a lot of, uh, we call it future computing, but things like cloud computing and the best ways to do that appears under that. And then we do all of these things to transform the industry. Whether it's education, finance, life sciences, my team up in Diaspora, we look at life sciences, chemistry, science, engineering, manufacturing, all these sectors. How these techniques can help in those domains. Last but not least, for blockchain, there is another uh, point that's getting added right at this moment, which is uh, not uh, added here at the moment. But I just wanted to make, so, sort of take a step back when I was coming here to think about some of the core research that we do and how that might help the student's uh, life in an academic organization. So I created this story. The story is such that there is a student who's somewhat concerned about their performance in the exam, uh, pretty anxious to know uh, the implications of that, but they really don't want to talk to anyone about it. And this is a classic situation. And there is a motivation story behind it as well. A, a colleague of mine lost their son at the third year of the university, partly because uh, of depression, but at the same time, they felt like there is no one to talk to. They didn't want to talk to anyone, but they wanted some system, uh, because youngsters are so used to having this sort of chat ability for everything. They wanted to have some sort of facility that mimic like human behavior. So looking at all of these things, what it in a sense says is that, again, the colors are not really good, but they want to know how they have performed in this particular situation. So this is more like the question answering, but it's not like you ask one question and you get one answer, and you ask another question, you get another answer. They want to have this interaction going back and forth with each other. And then one thing that systems really, really like currently is how to figure out the emotional coefficient of the students. How are they feeling? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they stressed? None of these are captured by the existing systems. 
And the third one that I'll talk a little bit more in terms of the research that we do is in terms of what we call it great security. And I'll try to give you a high level view about all these uh, things. So the first thing that we need to do is trying to understand what people are talking about, in this case students. Chris happened to refer the keyword that I always use, the internet. Whatever I say right at this moment may mean X to me, but it might mean something completely different to someone else. Or we all have different ways of talking in different contexts, but we really are asking for the same thing. So that really is what we are trying to do in these situations. We have a whole bunch of <coughs> research in this space, but also we have cloud services that have, uh, have these capabilities. For example, in the case of trying to understand the utterance of the person who makes uh, some form of communication. Say that I come here and I ask, well, have you seen Jonathan uh, from AFTA? And if AFTA says to me that, I'm just going to assume here that uh, Jonathan drives a red car. AFTA says that, oh, the red car is parked in the usual place. Now I know that AFTA is referring to the fact that Jonathan is a red car. But the computers are really, really not good at doing that at the moment. And we do a lot of research in that space, trying to use different graph representations of the information out there in the world, trying to link things together so that we can answer those kind of questions. The other one, we actually are working with the Bolton College on it at the moment. We have a research product in which no matter how you say your intent, it can figure out the underlying meaning of it. For example, in Alexa, the way they get the intent right is by analyzing a lot of communication. A couple of years ago, it came to light that, uh, even uh, as uh, recent as last year, they have actual humans behind some of these systems listening and interpreting what people are saying and correlating. Now, uh, this is a concern for some people in terms of privacy and how to make these systems better. A colleague of mine works on a system where no matter how you provide the same piece of information, he can distill that down to one particular representation. And we are working on Bolton College, uh, well, Bolton College and particular project. We are been trying to integrate some of these uh, capabilities so that students can get the answer they are after. After, maybe we should have started with the press release. You missed that. <laughs> and then uh, we have a couple of other things. Uh, so once you know the intent of uh, different people, you have to have a way to represent that so that you can help them to answer their questions in the context that they are asked for. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. And then also systems be more, much more empathetic. How am I doing that? You've got ten, ten minutes. Cool. So, without going to a lot of details, uh, we have an open source project uh, out of uh, research in the UK. Anyone can download this system. Uh, what it allows you to do is to model every piece of information that we extracted in the previous cases into a way a machine can understand it. But not only a machine, if, if a human reads this, this is actually a computer language that we have within the research team. It is readable. Uh, it probably is not, uh, it is not your machine code, uh, but you can read this. This is trying to describe how to describe a student having a cognitive workload and how to connect different parameters about that student uh, in a computer language. What we can do is to feed this into a machine and machine will understand exactly the way the human is understanding. So this is one approach we have taken to quickly generate different models about the world out there so that I can have one world view about the student's cognitive load after I might need to have one other uh, model or someone else in the audience, they can have a different model. But very easily, you can combine these models so that 
you can do the things about this way. The second part of the work is that remember there was a question about like different people say different things. Well, same thing, different way. Meaning that we have to have a way to interpret the question. Uh, we seem to be going under uh, differential forms characters, so we have a system called Hudson. Hudson allows you to ask a natural language query and to translate to a system language like this. So that as a user, I don't really ever have to worry about having to write this structured language uh, information. I can just simply ask a natural language query. And based on this system, we have done multiple different implementations of that. Uh, this is Dev, who's my manager. And this is all about a social network, about people working on different projects. Uh, this shows how uh, he's connected to different people, his statistics in terms of publications, uh, a timeline in which uh, he has collaborated with different academia, industry, and government folks. And this is actually a paper. Uh, this paper refers to this particular document. And this is all driven by that underlying uh, language system. Uh, I wasn't as brave as Chris in terms of doing a live demo, so I took some screenshots. But we also have a natural language query uh, facility at the bottom. So I can ask questions like, <coughs> Tell me something about David. Let me come to this screen. You can ask questions like, has David collaborated, collaborated with any publications with government and industry folks? And the system can understand it and provide you the right answers. This is a, another one uh, which we did last year, <coughs> an event called Moneyball. Uh, well, the Think IP, this is our big uh, IB wide conference. Uh, this is very much around baseball. Was happened to be in Las Vegas, and that's what we're going to see. Uh, but there are questions that you can ask from this system. For example, it can ask for a question, and the system can sort of figure out this is better represented as a graph versus a table versus this is actually happened to be a map because this is asking for the budget. <coughs> so again, these are like different interactive mechanisms that you can have in these kind of systems, so that students don't have to really worry about, or any other person using these kind of systems, don't really have to worry about asking uh, a specific question. They can express their idea, and the system can figure out what is the right answer. Now to the... Now I want to talk very briefly about the emotional aspect of uh, users of these systems. Uh, sadly, you can't read uh, most of this information, but these are some screen grabs I took from Twitter. The problem is that people do express different emotions, uh, whether it's on a student platform or social media. For example, I say that uh, in this tweet, it basically says something like that, just wait until you have minus $5 uh, in your bag papers and two exams and haven't slept for three days. Uh, this is something that, that a student has expressed uh, and it might give you an indication about the status of the student at that particular moment. Now, can we use some of this information that people express uh, to help systems to be a bit more vigilant about the emotional state? So instead of just providing just facts, can you temper the answers systems provide? Uh, with respect to the emotions that people are feeling. We did a piece of work with social media, but this is not limited to social media. There's a lot of work on recognizing facial expressions and translating that emotions. But none of the systems were doing what we call fine grained emotions, meaning that the state of the art actually uses only six emotions. They are all based on facial expressions. Uh, and the problem with that is that it's so difficult to correlate that back to any other emotion that people express. Whereas Pluchik, who's a psychologist, has established 32 varying different emotions 
and also different ways to combine uh, sort of low level emotions. Uh, for example, here it says ecstasy and uh, admiration, which get translated into something like joy over here. So if you find a couple of different uh, emotions, this provides a natural way to combine them. So that we can say that, okay, based on everything the student is talking about, or the person is asking to the system, they are feeling happy, joy, so the system can start at least providing some useful insights with respect to the emotion. And I think I'm almost, yeah, almost running out of time. Therefore, I will just quickly get into this because I want to touch base on this security aspect of the systems and the research that we do in that. So you can have all the amazing experiences, all the scalable systems. Uh, systems can figure out the emotions of people. But if you figure out that the system is leaking your information to the outside world, no one's really going to use that. Existing systems are pretty good at stopping outside people knowing about the information. But the biggest problem is that for a system to answer your question, it has to know what you're asking about. So in my ex example of the student feeling quite depressed about their situation, but really wanting to know like what are my options, they might not even want the university to know about it at that particular moment, unless of course they reach out. So one system we have developed will allow you to do this whole communication <coughs> end to end encrypted, meaning that even at the back end, when you ask a question and when the system is answering, system answers the question the right way, but it has no idea the answer it provided and how it computed. Because there is a black box kind of reason we can that stops anyone knowing what the thing is asked. So just to give a quick example, this is a classic situation. You have a policeman, there is a suspect for a bomb, there is a bank, but for the bank, Bob is very valuable. So if the police asks from the bank and bank says that, well, these are Bob's details and these are his financials, he's not going to be happy. Uh, well, also the customers of this bank is not going to be happy. With this system, query can be asked, give me the Bob's details. Bank has no idea what the situation it is asking from, but it provides the right answer back. And this has been proven to be one of the top 10 discoveries of the last decade. And the guy who worked on this uh, has the <coughs> merit award from the president's office. And I had a couple of other examples, but I'm going to skip that and come back to this and say that, so if we had these kind of systems where you can understand how people are feeling and what they are after, but at the same time we can guarantee the total security in terms of the communication, maybe there is a chance uh, these AI systems will get better in the future. With that, thank you. transactions that they make. So in this particular case, I'm asking some credit. 
you can be sure that I'm a trustworthy person because all these peers in this room can do some vouching on behalf of me. The way it works is that consider all of us as different gods. At least 51% of the room agrees that. I, they have had some experience with me. They tell you that it's okay. And that's how you establish the trust in the most fundamental sense. But then they have all these fancy ways of doing that. One way they do that is by looking at really, really expensive computational accounts. So, um, I don't know, just say that you have to multiply two large numbers. And you have to spend some money to do that and to say that I'm a trustworthy person. So, as soon as someone is willing to do that, I become part of a trustworthy uh, person for you. But you have no experience of me at all whatsoever. So that's uh, the fundamental of the way blockchain works. And then the good thing is that data that we all keep, since everyone at least like 51% can vouch for the authenticity of myself, I have some form of provenance because next time when David comes to me, he can look at me and go like, I say that he has some provenance. So we again use blockchain kind of facilities to make sure that our provenance information is also So it's more like transparent work. Yeah, transparent, yeah. And transparency when you don't have any trust whatsoever about the people that you interact with. Any question? Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned the empathy. Yeah. Uh, empathy and active leaders to humanize the changes and the creators and uh, the media of public or energy shape. Some people are there that put in the criticizes for that. Uh, is there a day that we become too empathetic to these machines and the people around us? I think it's probably the time I say it depends. <laughs> uh, it, it's just the fact that if you really want these systems to be showing some autonomous behavior. You want these systems to understand the emotional situation of the people. And if you don't do that, uh, I'm like one of the biggest problems is that if you ask a very emotional question from a system, and if you just get like a black and white answer, you might uh, it might actually be the tipping point. So it's important, in my opinion, and maybe I'm biased because uh, I do work on this area, but you find that um, empathy in a system can actually help uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, suicide uh, is one of the key things. Um, and, and these helplines, uh, my colleague, he actually runs a service now uh, through a charity where adults can chat when they are really feeling depressed. But in those kind of situations, if you don't get any empathy from the system, uh, it probably is not the system to have. Yes, right. yeah, the empathy is at the foundation of the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. Thank you. Five more questions, sir. Yes. Yeah, I want to ask you about bias. So, bias. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things when I move on artificial intelligence and different use cases, the current theme is um, one of the most problematic aspects is the inbuilt bias that's very difficult to diagnose. Do you have any thoughts on that? So we have a ginormous effort <laughs> within research in Sintana, but it's very much trying to curate data sets. Biggest problem as you quite rightly said, and there is plenty of examples out there. For example, Microsoft uh, released a chatbot that can learn out of social media. Within three days, they have to take the service offline because it was just learning all the wrong things because what is thrown at it, it learns. Also, this good research to say that, for example, in terms of recruitment, uh, historical data, if you put a particular person, uh, well, a pool of people, it will probably identify a class of folks as a potential candidate. That's because the system is so useful, this data, and it has been shown that it discriminated against gender, race, 
And it's not the fault of the AI systems. It's just the data that you feed into it. So you really, really have to be careful in terms of the data that you provide. You want to make sure that all the bases are covered. And it's OK to have a bit of noise and the biasness, because otherwise, it's not going to reflect uh, or cancel out the biases coming from different sectors. But the majority of the data has to be showing the real ground. Thank you very much, sir.